Okay, welcome to Spine Conference. Today's lecture is going to be on ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. And I know everybody's really excited about this. This, by the way, is a painting of where I'm going, Aaron. A la Palms. I know you like the beach. Where else? Uh, South Carolina. Okay, so the first case is an 86-year-old woman, actually the only case, 86-year-old woman who presented to the office with right arm weakness. She um, had a 10-day history of progressive weakness, right greater than left upper extremities. And she, uh, she went to see her primary care physician who um, uh, immediately sent her to the ER due, due to her symptoms. And she was ruled out for a stroke. She had um, carotids, um, I think a scan of her head. She was seen at Hartford on July 1st, and she had a 10-day history of dropping objects with her hands. Um, uh, she said that no fine motor uh, strength. She couldn't do anything with her hands. She described it in her own words. Her right hand feels worthless because she's right hand dominant. She, when she tried to hold a, a cup, she had to do it with both hands. She also had ataxia with uh, difficulty ambulating. Um, her past medical so she was her past medical history is significant hypothyroidism Addison's disease, which can cause Addison's disease, which is um, uh, adrenal insufficiency. It can give you these similar type symptoms of fatigue, weakness, uh, um, urinary tract infection, cataract. Now I had performed a previous surgery on her T6 to T10 laminectomy fusion. She was an unusual case. She had severe stenosis and a fracture. Uh, at those levels, and she was myelopathic from that condition two years ago. Did I even tell you this? And she did very well from that. Um, and then diverticulosis. Uh, her, her exam is five feet, 142 pounds, and she was very ataxic. Her right hand was uh, very clumsy, and uh, she could just barely uh, write uh, with it. Um, she presented to the office July 14th, so she was admitted July 1st. She was sent home after a couple of days, and she came to me July 14th, and I didn't know she had any of these problems. So just to, to review um, gait, these are the essence. This is the essence of gait. Um, there's a stance. So you just look at one limb. The right leg is here lit up. See that, Aaron? Mm -hmm. And you just stick with one leg when you talk about gait. And this is the stance phase. In other words, you're actually standing on that leg and then the rest is swing, then the leg is swinging. So the first thing is foot strike, and it's usually a heel, and then toe off on the other side, and then, then you push off with your toe, toe off, and then you swing through, and they should alternate. Um, uh, and it's at one point, you have both legs are on the ground, double limb, double limb support, which is the definition of walking. If you don't have both legs on the ground, you're running. Or you're a horse. Or you're a horse. You can have all horses can have all four. <laughs> so this gate. So let's um so she had she definitely had an ataxic gate. And let's go over an ataxic gate. So you can see this man is is a, I think I thought was a good example. You see how his feet are wide? He's walking slowly and clumsily. You see that? Uh, look at him, he's looking at the ground. And do you know why he's doing that? Do you have any idea? He look at he looks at the ground. Yeah, he's got no proprioception, so he has dorsal column uh, compression of his spinal cord or damage. So he's constantly having to look at the ground because he can't feel the ground or sense his uh, in space where he is. And it's wide base. It's clumsy. It's not a normal heel strike. You see how his feet are kind of flat? A little bit heel strike actually is leaning forward. This is how she walked, actually, exactly how she walked, except she had a, cane, a, a walker. Usually people, this is a young guy, and, and young people will try to walk, but but older people don't do it. They either get a cane or a um, walker. Especially kids will do it, but adults will not do it. Okay. So what would we do in the office? We ask them to do a heel, a tightrope gait, basically a heel-toe straight line gait. Uh, and the, the ability to walk on your toes and heels, you, you need to have uh, very good balance. Um, 
and also to walk on your toes you need to have S1 uh, function. Um, finger escape sign is a, another sign of um, myelopathy when you ask uh, to uh, fully extend the hands and, and, uh, and um, extend the wrist and hold the fingers tight. The, the fifth and fourth finger drop. So it's um, something else that you can do to see if people are myelopathic walking on their heels. So here's a normal x-ray. You can see all the bones are normally aligned. This is a young person, no arthritis whatsoever. The disc heights are all well maintained uh, and there are no ossifites. See how the, the disc space between the two is, is nice and big? Now how would you describe the abnormalities on this x-ray, Aaron? Disc spaces are not... So C2, C3 is very flat, right? Correct. C3, C4 disc space? Somewhat. I mean, it's okay. It's okay. Ossified anteriorly, yeah, right? C4, C5 this base is good? It's okay. 5, 6? Slightly bad, right? Yeah. How about the facets? Totally normal? Look, no. look at this facet. See these facets? Where the, the two lateral masses yeah. come together? So compare that to that. They're not well defined, especially. Yeah, it's hard to see it, first of all, because it's not a perfect lateral, because this is a perfect lateral and they're all lined up. And young people, you can get a perfect lateral, and, and older people, you can't. And also, they're sclerotic, right? So they, they uh, have increased um, uh, joint space. When she flexed forwards, uh, she, had no, um, she had no abnormal motion. On the AP view, again, you can see the sclerosis. See the sclerosis of the facets on the AP view? So what do you think of the CAT scan? So just so you know, in your ER, everybody gets a CAT scan. It's a cheap, fast, cheap, fast. study. Then they have a CAT scan in the ER usually. So what do you think of the CAT scan? Um, there is something behind C2. Yeah, well here's C2, right? Oh, sorry, Remember? C3, C4. And C3, C4, right? Look, there's a, some, some ossified, because you can see it on CAT scan, some type of ossifying abnormality directly posterior to the C3 uh, body, also extending up into the C4 body. Remember the C2, C3 disc space is decreased. There's also something here too. What do you usually see posterior to C2? Right here usually. But the panis that you get from rheumatoid arthritis, right? That's right. So, kind of looks similar to it, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And here's an axial cut at the same area. So here's the spinal canal. See that? Now this is the next level down. They're kind of shingled. So that's why it kind of looks like that. But you can just imagine like it goes like this. So this thing here is severely compressing the spinal cord, isn't it? Because the normal canal is just right here. And it's ossifying. The spinal canal should look like this. What lives in this little hole? Vertebral artery, right? So when we do our, our, our lateral mass screws, we start in the middle and slightly medial, and we angle it lateral so that we don't hit the vertebral artery. So that's an important that's an important thing always to remember. And if we go too lateral, this thing breaks off. So that's just the point to remember when you're putting in lateral mass screws. So what do you see on the MRI? Uh, so she was basically her story. She was admitted, uh, had all the tests to rule out stroke, and then the, I think it was the second hospital day they ordered the MRI scan. Go ahead. Um, so you can more clearly see. C3, C4. Um, compression, right? Compression. Yeah, so the, the first thing you see is definite compression of the spinal cord, right? It looks like it's an hourglass deformity there of the spinal cord. And here's the C2. Do you think there's a lot of pressure here on the brain stem from the C2 panis? Not, not, not bad, right? No. And the other thing C2 is that it can invade the frame and magnum. So this point to this point is the frame and magnum. So when people get uh, occiput C1, C2 instability and abnormalities, the C2 can drive into the skull and compress the brainstem. So she doesn't really have it. See, she's, uh, her C2 is way below the frame and magnum. Not that much panis. So it's a very, she has a very mild case of C2 stenosis. But this thing is very, very concerning, right? And also, what describe the colors of C3 like is it is it homogeneous heterogeneous like what do you what, what do you think C3 this stuff right here oh, the color the, yeah it's 
heterogeneous. Yeah, right? Do you think that's unusual, interesting? Like, what are your thoughts? What do you, why do you think it is? I don't know, but I'm just guessing. Um, On MRI, what is black, usually? The discs, black, right? Right. The discs, the cartilage, but also what else is black? Cortical bone. So this blackness could be cortical bone, but what's the white stuff? What could it be? I don't know, I'm just guessing. Maybe it's the same as the vertebral body. It maybe looks it, similar to the vertebral Yeah, body. maybe it's cancellous bone. Maybe it's, uh, I don't know, maybe it's cartilage. It's very interesting though, right? There's some, some kind of, they're different. And uh, posteriorly, this, what's this black stuff between the two lamina that's colored yellow? Usually, like a flavum, yeah. So here, at the same level, at C3, C4, she's got hypertrophy of her ligament and flavum as well. So it's a little bit of a, a double whammy. She's compressed in the front for, by this by this problem, and also by the back by the ligament and flavum um, hypertrophy. And it's not from collapse of the disc base because the disc base at C3, C4 is well maintained, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a little bit hypertrophic. So this is again, this is a close up now. You see the spinal cord is severely compressed between these two processes, and this is a this is a pretty big uh, lesion here. It's almost uh, maybe 60% the width of the vertebral body into the spinal canal. And here's a um, T um, uh, one weighted image of the same process, and it doesn't really add too much. You can see the anatomy a little better, um, but it doesn't add too much. You can see the pressure on the spinal cord. It, the, it looks mm -hmm. more homogeneous. Than on that view, yeah. How about the rest of the spinal canal? Is the rest of the spinal canal okay? It's okay. Maybe it's okay. It's Not totally normal, but okay, right? Spinal canal is good. Mild disc bulging at the other levels. So, so it seems that the process is really starts at C2, C3, and sort of ends at C4, C5. So again, this is the this is the close-up view, and you see this heterogeneous character to this posterior mass, posterior of the vertebral bodies. So here's an axial cut. What do you think of this, uh, the spinal cord here at C2? It's okay. This is good, right? How about a C3? This is a C3 pedicle. Compressed. Yeah, so here it's nice and round, and here it looks like a kidney. kidney. Yeah, so it's, uh, so it's compressed by this anterior process. And then this is the worst level, C3, C4. What do you think of the spinal cord here? It has no... Very, very compressed, right? And then C4, C5? Uh, okay. It's okay. Yeah, there's CSF anterior, posterior, the spinal cord, some mild bulging there. So the, the spinal canal should look like this normally at around uh, C4. And this is what the lateral of the spinal canal, uh, sagittal of the spinal canal should look like. The spinal cord should have plenty of room both anteriorly and posteriorly. And uh, here's a uh, the axial cut of uh, what normal should look like, so you so you know in your mind's eye what normal should look like. And this is uh, what a uh, diagram would look like of the spinal cord itself, normally. And the spinal cord head should have a normal size. Now, what's normal? It varies in different people. So, uh, in general, it, it's at C2 you have a lot of room, but then here it's about 12 to 17. Um, Millimeters, and we have some numbers here. This is from a Rene Louise Rene Louise textbook, where he um, drew what he thought was a normal spinal canal uh, shape at different levels of the spine. C C one and C two is very big, and then in the in the mid cervical areas, it's it's a little bit of a triangle, and then in the thoracic areas, it's round. It gets kind of small in the middle of the thoracic spine, and then also he he um, measured it. And he found at the anterior posterior diameter, the AP diameter, we'll go at C4 is where we're, we're talking about. The mean is 14 millimeters. So the spinal cord mean is about 10. So normal is about, mean is about 14. So that gives you two millimeters uh, in front and behind the anterior and posterior of the spinal cord, so that's plenty of room. But the range is very variable, nine to 19. So some people just have a small spinal canal, and we see that all the time. And I bet you, it's not that common to get a 9 or 10 millimeter spinal canal. The reason why Rene Louis saw it is because he was a surgeon. Um, but most people uh, have the normal canals. And the transverse diameter is a bit wider, 25, 25 millimeters, 24 millimeters.
So it should be about 14, 15. The spinal cord is 10 millimeters. So if it's any, if it's 10 millimeters or less, there's not enough room for the spinal cord. And this is what it should look like. And you see if there's spurs pushing inwards to the spinal cord, it will compress the spinal canal. So this woman has ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament. So who gets ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament? Uh, is it just, just Japanese people? No. No, right? I mean, that, that's what we thought 20 years ago because they had a, a rich literature and treatment for this side of thing. But Americans get it all the time. So it's usually in the fifth or sixth decade. It's usually men, two to one men to female. She happens to be a female. Um, half of people who have it that are Caucasian also have DISH. So it's probably some kind of diffuse uh, metabolic process. Risk factors are hypoparathyroidism, hypophosphatemic rickets, uh, hyperinsulinemia, obesity. She's, she has none of those. And it can, it can present very differently. The, her, she, she is localized like this. <clears throat> just at one level, just a local area of OPLL, ossification of the longitude of the ligament. But it can be in two different areas, segmental. You see that this is very common when you see it uh, continuous, and this is when I think OPLL, I usually think of this as continuous, uh, broad uh, ossification, uh, compressing the spinal canal broadly. It can also be mixed in different areas. So it doesn't go by any type of uh, specific character. Here's different types. Here's, a, here's a, um, a continuous one. Here's another continuous one. Here's like a focal one, localized one, which compressed and compressed. And this one's a, a bit pedunculated. You see that? Mm -hmm. It can be on one side. It doesn't have to be dead center in the middle. Um, here's another uh, broad one. So it can really vary in its shape. So here's the uh, axial cut of the cervical spine. This is my artist rendition. Posterior longitudinal ligament. And this yellow thing is the spinal cord and the spinal canal. And remember we said there should be about two millimeters in the front, two millimeters in the back, plenty of CSF about every level. And as the posterior longitudinal ligament uh, becomes ossified and grows, it slowly compresses the spinal cord because it's compressed here posteriorly by the lamina. Uh, and then the treatment is you cut the lamina and, put, and uh, posteriorly open the lamina. This is the laminoplasty treatment. So who progresses, who gets worse? I mean, can you watch these? The people who progress neurologically is 60% uh, canal stenosis, six millimeters or less for the spinal cord. Uh, you remember, you want to have 10. People who move their neck a lot, they get worse. Uh, and OPLL, that's lateral, is worse. And the ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament, the cells have features very similar to osteoblasts. So again, the bone is made up of two things, osteoblasts, which eat up the bone, and osteoblasts that make bone. And osteoblasts, histologically, are usually rim, rim the spicules, and they lay down bone. So these, when you take the OPLL out, which some people have done and studied it, they have very similar features to osteoblasts. They make bone, and that makes sense. So this is the um, bone of a child, and uh, this shows um, uh, endochondral ossification. So the, the cartilage uh, cells are here, and they didn't, then they differentiate, and then they die, and then they become ossified. So that's how uh, bones grow in children, basically. And I think OPLL uh, lays down bone in endochondral ossification. So there's some cartilage, uh, and then they differentiate, and they become bone. And I think what we were looking at in an MRI was that. I think it was like it's like a bone forming area in her cervical spine, and some of that was cartilage, some of that was formed bone. Okay, so here's she again. See, this is like, for some reason, it's acting like a growth plate. It's laying down bone and it's increasing. It's compressing her spinal cord. So, how do you approach this? There's a radiographic measurement that you can do. It's called the K line. So the K line is called the kyphosis line. If you draw a line from the middle of the C2 spinal canal and the middle of the C7 spinal canal, if the lesion doesn't cross it, that you can, you can treat this uh, posteriorly. But if the lesion crosses it, uh, posterior decompression won't work as well, and you have to approach it anteriorly. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The other thing is the double layer sign in CAT scan which is very important to know. 
that if there's a double layer sign, that means that the ossification, that the, it means that the dura most likely is ossified. So if you went anteriorly, you would get, you would get a dural tear. So if you see a black in front of the OPLL, that means that the dura is involved and you cannot go anteriorly or you will get a CSF leak. And that makes kind of sense. Right? Um, so to classify the myelopathy, this is Neurich's classification. A zero is no signs of cord dysfunction. A two is at normal gait, um, despite exam findings of cord compression. Two is mild gait. Three is moderate gait impairment. Four is they need assistant devices. And five is wheelchair bound. So what was she? She's a four and a five, yeah. Okay, so any questions up to this point, Mr. David? No. Okay. Does that make you want to go to the Outer Banks? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is this is the K line for our patient, middle of C two, middle of C seven. So we could probably treat this posteriorly. Um, and then this is this is kind of like what I call Spiro's line. As <laughs> This is what I do is I think like what would happen if I took lamina off like where does the spinal cord have the capacity to drift backwards so just think if you took off C3 C4 and C5 the spinal cord then this point could drift to here and it could go all along here and then here so the spinal cord this point could go to here and that point could go to here and then what do you think? Would you have enough room? It looks like you probably would, right? Because then the, the width of the spinal cord is from here to here. So it looks like the spinal cord could be from here to here. It's about the same. I mean, I didn't measure it, but it looks like it would work. And if you take off 6 and 7, then the spinal cord can drift even farther backwards. You see that? But then you're taking off more lamina, and that's more surgery. and you take you have risks of instability so this was my operative plan and this is what I did is this is the artist rendition here's the lesion here's the spinal cord compression and then I took off three I took off four I took off five the plan was just to take off half of five but remember in surgery we felt that we had to take all of it off but this is my every time I do a preoperative planning like when I think about cases and if you can draw it then you can you can affect it in your mind so when you go into surgeries Everybody says like the surgeons are people with good hands. I don't think that's the truth. I think it's surgeons have the, the knowledge is in their brain really and they and in their mind. What do you think, David? I always think like it's in your mind's eye where all the power is, you know, yeah, like I would, I would agree. I mean you could do the the wrong operation very well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And also like, you know, your hands could shake or whatever, but if you know what you have to do, you can do it. And and, and that's the most important thing is the knowledge in your mind to affect something. So I also removed some of uh, C2, just a little bit of C2, and then here are our lateral maskers at C3 to C5, and we fused uh, C3 to C5. So here's the post-op imaging, and this is uh, the artifact from the. Um, now I didn't I didn't want to sit on her any farther because she was she was like grossly myelopathic. She could not walk, and in fact, from the day I, I when I saw her in her office, I admitted her. The next day, when she signed the consent, she said, "My hand's even worse today." So I, I felt like this could this could not wait any longer, and that she could, you know, deteriorate, and you know, potentially, you know, you could die at this level because you would stop breathing. So we did the laminectomy, C3, C4, C5, fused it. This is just artifact from the lateral mass group, and you can see here the spinal cord. What do you think, Aaron? I think it looks good. Yeah, it did drift backwards. Um, there still is deformity of the spinal cord here from this lesion. But it looks like um, spinal fluid. Anterior, yeah. And it looks like there's plenty of room for the spinal cord. Um, so risks of going anterior, why not, why not go anterior? What can you think of? What problems could you run into going anterior? Like take this out like it's an ACDF, like a disc, in well, this case. Is that double layer sign? You could get a CSF leak, and an anterior CSF leak in the neck is a big problem because it may not, there's no way really to close it or repair it. You're going to have to trust the glue in the patch. Also, how about C2, C3? Is that easy to get to? 
it's hard, right? The mandible gets right. in the way. Although she has no teeth, so you could really push the mandible up. But still, it's very difficult. It's a whole. It's it's a it's a hard angle. Um. So here, and and the other thing we saw, which was new, was the spinal cord signal change, which you really couldn't appreciate on the pre-op MRI scan because the spinal cord was so compressed you couldn't just see it. But then when it expanded, um, you can see the area where the spinal cord damage. Here's a T2-weighted image, which uh, shows the anatomy a lot better, and the, the uh, spinal cord signal change. And you can see the before, the after. And I thought the spinal cord would drape back to here. It didn't, but it, it's not bad. And you can see CFSF anterior to the spinal cord. So why is the spinal cord still uh, crooked here? What do you think? Well, why, why wouldn't it be just flat up against there? Let me take the lesion out. Maybe the spinal cord has a deformity. Maybe it's just that it's like because it had pressure on for so long. Maybe it's just you let it go and it's just bent, you know, because of the chronic pressure. And it could look different the time period post operatively. And this was immediate post op. Yeah, it may change. This is post op day one. Um, so this gives you, this, this shows you like. Now, do you think she would be better if we had taken off six and seven? Now, in retrospect, you always want to criticize yourself so you can become better. What do you think, Aaron? Maybe, but maybe, yeah. But that then, if you an instability risk, right? So if you remove lamina at the base of the spine, anytime you take things from the base of a, a level, like either the thoracic level, the lumbar level, or the cervical cervical level, there's a lot of stress at the base. So there's a higher probability of instability at the base. So you want to leave the attachments there. So the the relevant examples are C2. You want to leave the you want to leave C2 intact so the head doesn't um, um, come off of C2. Uh, at C7, you want to leave that intact, C6, C7, T1. And then in the thoracic spine, you want to leave T12 intact if you can. In the lumbar spine, L5, S1. So you, otherwise, they become unstable. Here's a T2, uh, T1 image. And the axial cut, you really can't see, but you can't see because the artifact from the lateral masculine, but you see the spinal cord's got plenty of room. That's it. So, any questions about ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament? Now with a uh, with chronic compression of the uh, spinal cord, uh, you said there there was retained deformity. Uh, do fibroblasts develop in a compressed, chronically compressed spinal cord? I think or so. They the scar. Not, not, you, you don't know that because you're not you know your patient's alive. But yeah, it scars in autopsy. Patients or research. It does. Cases, it does. It do scars. See fibroblasts, which uh, scar. Yeah. Which tends to hold the, the, the cord in that shape. Yeah, it does. So that's that's. It does. So you know, we, there are cases where patients died and they did the autopsy and they, they found that. And what's the, what's the initial cause of the uh, of the development? Calcification. Nobody it's knows. Ossification of the posterior it's longitudinal not, it's ligament. It's not related to uh, RA. No. And, uh, it's 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 a process. It's you said that the the uh, deformity up further up on the uh, cervical spine is more like could, RA. Could have been from RA. Right. It's C two. But this is not related. Mm -hmm. to it's RA. more. It's probably a cousin or a similar disease process to DISH, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis where it's usually older people, uh, usually fifth, sixth, seventh decade, they start to ossify their whole spine. Not like ankylosing spondylitis, but sort of similar. Their disc kites are well-maintained and they just ossify their ligaments. So it, it's, it's a disease process similar to that. So for some reason, the longitudinal ligaments act like osteoblasts and, and they lay down bone. In OPLL, it goes into the spinal canal. This usually doesn't cause spinal canal stenosis, it just causes stiffness. But OPLL, uh, can, it grows into the spinal canal, which is a problem because that's where the spinal cord is. You can get these big ossifites in other areas, but then they just push into the retroperitoneal space or the abdomen, who cares? You, know, there's got, you have plenty of room there. There's no critical anatomical structures there. But the, obviously, the spinal canal is a critical anatomical structure. So when it goes into the spinal canal, then it's a problem for the for the organism. So any other questions? 
too bad you can't encourage uh, osteoclastic to get into the area. Yeah. I, I, I don't know how that would be done, but. Yeah, but that's that's, that's, that's a tough thing. I mean, th what you're talking about is Paget's. So Paget's is a um, uncoupling of the function of uh, osteoblasts and osteoclasts because usually it's very, very important that they function perfectly. And Paget's, it, it's hair wired. So they lay down all sorts of bone. Their bones get bigger and thicker and weird. And then they get, then the osteoclasts go crazy and the bones get weak and, and, and they, it's very painful. And that, that uncoupling of the, of the osteoblasts and osteoclasts is a disease process, which we call Paget's. So it's a, it's a it's a matter of only a stasis. Yeah, it's a synchronized. It's a it's a really important synchronized process that we have in our bones. All right, Aaron, when's your next beach vacation? September tenth. Okay, I'm going in a, in a week. David, any uh, favorite beach for you? Uh, the Outer Banks are in uh, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've been there several times. I like it. It's, um, yeah, I, I, I thought it was a, a good place. It takes a long time, and then there's so much traffic. That's a, as you, as the last uh, two hours of the trip are terrible. Misery. Terrible, especially and if there's kids in the car. Because of that one bridge <laughs> yeah. where you cross to get into. Uh, yeah. Kitty Hawk area. Yeah, there's and, kids in the car and they say, We're here. Yeah. It's like, Oh, wait, we got another hour or two until yeah, we get yeah, to the you house. Think you're almost there, but it takes forever. So. Yeah. So that's the, uh, that's the disadvantage. And you, you pass up a few other beaches on the, on the way. Um, what's, what's the beach in Oh, Virginia Beach. Virginia Beach. You ever go there? I've never been there. I, I haven't either. But 